I'm your host, Not For Possession, Narcissa DeVille, and welcome to hell. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Oh my God, it has been so long since I've made a video. Um, I'm sorry in advance for the glare that my glasses are going to give off, but I am trying to do something where I'm gonna need to be able to read, so yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to just apologize. I know it's been like 10,000 years. I am so, so sorry. I wish I had a good excuse for you, but I don't. So let's just get into this. So the video I'm making today is going to be a video that I've been thinking about for a long time, um, because everyone is doing it right now, which is the 10 year kind of, I guess like glow up type thing of like, just people who make things, especially um, an amazing artist that I love, kind of did a redo of an art project she did 10 years ago. So I thought, since we're about to hit 2020 in like five minutes, I thought, okay, let me do this video real quick and talk about just sort of um, how my writing has changed over the last decade. Um, I would like to say that I have something that's technically from 2010, but the only thing I could actually find was um, something from 2012. So it's about two years off, but it's roughly a decade ago. Um, and that is the self-published, oh, let me cover the name, the self-published book that I put out in 2011, 2012. Um, this amazing cover was actually made by my best friend, Adrienne. Um, I did self-publish this. I wrote it during NaNoWriMo. Uh, I wanna say I wrote this during NaNoWriMo 2011, and then I put it out in 2012. So it was like early 2012. Um, but this is a book that I wrote forever ago. It was available on Amazon. It was also available for hardback. This is the hardback version. I still have a bunch of copies. So I thought I'd read a few pages from this and then read the beginning of a book that I just put up on Wattpad because as some of you who follow me may know, I actually recently just started putting up a book on Wattpad that I'm going to be sharing um, periodically over the next few months. So I'm very, very, very excited about that. Links will be in the description below, but I just kind of wanted you to see just, you know, how much my writing has changed over the last decade. Now, obviously this is a story that I am still working on, the characters I'm still working on. So just understand these are character names that you're going to hear. Um, the story has changed a lot over the last decade, but this is not the same story that I'm putting on Wattpad. So just so you're aware, it is two different stories. Um, but I don't really have a, I mean, I do have a more recent version, but the more recent version is like still from almost two years ago now. So I figured let's give it an actual decade update. So here it is. Uh, let's start and I'll start with chapter one. It's, it's a real book. Like I really went for it when I was self-publishing and I was so, so excited and so, so proud of it until I wasn't. And yeah, so I took it out off the market like ooh, a hot minute ago. <laughs> okay. Chapter one. Dark clouds loomed overhead as rain fell from the sky like teardrops from the heavens as the ornate gold casket, obscenely bejeweled with sapphires and rubies, slowly made its way down the long, thin, rolling streets of London on the shoulders of 13 warlock guards. Christopher Rosewood, the son of the queen, followed directly behind the casket, his face unyielding and bereft of emotion. It was of little consequence to him that his mother was dead, or at least that seemed to be the general consensus. After all, the body had never been recovered from the rubble of the Circe Hotel, and for a few days after the bombing, many had debated whether or not had in fact been killed by the mysterious explosion. After much debate on the matter and nearly a month's long inquiry by the council, it was decided that the queen was in fact dead and a funeral would be held with or without her body. Christopher groaned inwardly as he heard the mourning of the crowds on either side of him and tried desperately to resist the urge to roll his eyes at the ridiculous display. If only they knew the truth, he thought bitterly. He refused to look at any of them. He refused to be made part of this spectacle by acknowledging their pitying stares and not overly quiet whispers. That poor boy all alone. Both his parents gone and at such a young age. You think he'll take over the throne? 
Christopher growled, digging his nails into the palms of his hands in an effort to keep from screaming as rage boiled in his brain. He had no desire to take over the crown. In fact, the very idea of even being a part of the royal family repulsed him greatly. He hated the crown, the council, and especially Catherine. The only reason he had come to her funeral in the first place was because Cipriana had all but begged him to. It was just the sort of publicity the crown needed, especially now. A distraction against the real problems, and not for the first time, either. Typical, he thought. He couldn't help but wonder how different things would have been if the public had known the truth. How Catherine had been cold and indifferent to him growing up. How distant and completely unavailable she had been to him at the times in which he had needed her most. How she had threatened to disown him after he came out to her. Would they still be able to mourn his loss when he couldn't? Didn't? The funeral procession made its way up Constitution Hill towards the Hades ossuary. Christopher followed behind the hideously inappropriate coffin, trying desperately not to stare at it as, he, as it hit the sunlight. The chief council witch walked directly behind Christopher on his left. Cipriana was by far probably the oldest living council witch. Her hair, once a rich chocolate brown, was now lined with gray, and her eyes, a once vibrant amethyst, had become something of a dull, purplish gray. Her face was lined with wrinkles, undoubtedly from stress. Catherine was, after all, the second queen who had died during her tenure, and the questions had been asked by more than a few people whether or not she had been involved, particularly considering her obvious involvement with the elder queen's daughter some twelve years previous. Behind Christopher, and to his right, stood Holly Ivering, a young thirty-something witch with mousy brown hair and sparkling emerald eyes, the enchantress of the Witches' Academy, the local school for the magical elite serving only the most powerful and influential families to create tomorrow's politicians and all-around brilliant minds. <clears throat> Christopher had had the misfortune of attending the school once upon a time, and he had not been impressed. He had avoided the ravages of being royalty at a time when people simply weren't sure they even wanted or trusted the monarchy. The shift in loyalty might have been good news for Cipriana, but as it was, the people trusted the council even less than the monarchy. There had been talk, although there had been talk for centuries, of a new system of government, perhaps closer to what the mortals had. A democracy? It seemed highly unlikely, as there were too many influential families who had grown up with the Raleigh monarchy to see it fall to modernists now. Still, democracy had its appeal, didn't it? At least in theory. The fact was, watching the mortals had proven democracy rarely worked quite the way it should. There was always, there would always manage to be corruption and dirty politics. Perhaps the problem wasn't the government, but the royal family itself. Perhaps the monarchy could work if someone who was not necessarily royalty were allowed to take over. Christopher turned around briefly. Cipriana and Holly were whispering something back and forth to each other. He rolled his eyes, turning back around as several photographers took his picture. He could just see the headline now, Prodigal Son of the Queen Returns. He wouldn't be staying, however, if that's what they were hoping, he told himself as they approached the gates of the Hades ossuary. Christopher smirked as he saw his potential escape. The public hadn't been allowed access past the gates. He could just leave now and disappear back to his quiet existence of peaceful obscurity with Eric, when suddenly he felt Holly grab his shoulder. Christopher groaned inwardly as he felt his escape slipping further and further away. He turned on the spot and stopped, watching as Cipriana and the Warlock guards continued towards the ossuary. I need to talk to you, she whispered behind him. About? Christopher hissed, rather furious that his only chance of escape without making a scene had been thwarted. Holly didn't respond. Instead, she stepped in front of him and followed Catherine's coffin. Christopher growled, running quickly after her. There was no point in trying to escape now, he told himself. She had, after all, found him once before, a dimension away and across the Atlantic Ocean she had found him. There was nowhere he could run that she would not eventually catch up to him, and it would be cumbersome to uproot, uproot him and Eric just to avoid detection. No, he would stay and listen to whatever it was Holly had to say. Then he would leave. They both arrived at the gravesite just as the coffin was being lowered into the ground. I'm surprised there isn't a mausoleum or some kind of ridiculous marble statue, he thought, rolling his eyes again. For a brief moment, Christopher was reminded of the day his father had been bur buried in the same ossuary. It had, if he recalled properly, been on a day very much like today. The clouds had hung low in the sky for David Rosewood's passing, as rain had poured much harder than it ever would for Catherine. If, indeed, the long-standing belief that rain was tears of the gods themselves, then that day the gods had wept for David's passing. More Christopher himself, who had been deeply saddened that day, and he distinctly remembered one of the few memories he could 
recalled quite clearly from his youth, wishing that it had been a Catherine who died instead. For on that day, Christopher had lost the only parent who had truly cared for him. Perhaps to some, Christopher looked like a cold, looked cold and unfeeling as he stood over Catherine's grave. But he didn't care. He refused to think of her as her as his mother, or to even use the word in place of her name. He had no desire to even pretend as though he was saddened by her passing, much less put on a brave face for the audience as though they were as though he were some sort of martyr. After a few moments of quiet respect, several people who knew Catherine best were asked to get up and speak about her life, a fact Cipriana had kept decidedly secret from Christopher. Perhaps she knew, or perhaps she had heard from their heard their feuds. Whatever the reason, Christopher didn't particularly care. He had nothing good to say about Catherine, and something told him no one would be particularly interested in hearing his opinions of her anyway. His mind faded in and out during the speeches, catching words and phrases here and there like heroine and a queen to be remembered. It was only when a former colleague of Catherine's, who Christopher vaguely remembered, having heard mention of at some party during a happier time, had called her a tender and loving mother, that Christopher had felt himself snap. Holly's eyes widened as if sensing the impending doom pulled him aside. Before he could react or even fight, Holly snapped her fingers and the two vanished from the ossuary. Sorry about that, she said simply, as they reappeared just outside a small cafe on the other side of London. Christopher sighed. He supposed he couldn't really blame her. After all, she couldn't control what people thought about Catherine any more than he could. No one knew the real Catherine, he said softly as they made their way into the cafe. I mean, that whole display was just... He shook his head as he pulled off his pea coat in the overly warm dining room and sat down. Holly sighed and nodded. She could appreciate his outrage even if she didn't really know Catherine the way Christopher did. Were there really two different Catherines? The one the world saw and the one only Christopher knew? Listen, the real reason I wanted to talk to you was because there's something we really need to discuss, she said, expertly changing the subject. Christopher eyed her, just as their waitress came over to take their drink order. Coffee, Christopher said shortly. Black. Holly snorted. New York had certainly changed him, she noted as he folded his arms over the table and laid his head on them, staring out the window. I'll have a tea, please, she said. Extra cream and sugar. She added, almost as an afterthought. The waitress smiled and nodded as she turned on her heel and left. Christopher sighed before lifting his head off the table. So go on, he said, continuing to stare out the window. London was particularly beautiful this time of year, he thought, as several cars sped by the window. Perhaps he could admit that a part of him, even if only a small part, missed it here. Well, now that Catherine's gone, we're really in need of a new leader, she explained, wringing her hands together nervously. And? Well, being her son and all, you are next in line for the throne, she replied. No, Christopher said sharply. Holly sighed. She had expected as much. Please, just hear me out. Save your breath, Holly. The answer is still no. Why can't you do it? He asked with a dismissing wave of his hand. Holly snorted. Firstly, I'm not royal by blood or even by marriage. Second, considering the fact that I'm the love child of the former queen's adulterous husband, I'm not sure anyone would even acknowledge my authority, even if it were possible. And anyway, I have absolutely no political aspirations whatsoever. That makes two of us, Christopher replied. What about Margaret? Prison, as you well know, Holly glared. So break her out. She can't be any worse than Catherine was. Holly decided it was just easier to ignore him. Christopher, there is no one else. Would I be asking you if there was? I know how much you hate this, but you're the last remaining descendant of the Raleigh line. Then I guess the Raleigh family name dies with me, doesn't it? Good riddance as far as I'm concerned. Holly glared. You owe it to your people, she cried at last. Christopher's eyes lowered. Owe it to them, he growled and leaped to, leapt to his feet. I don't owe anyone anything. My mother may have been willing to take over the throne after her mother died, but I'm not. She knew damn well I didn't want to be king. If she didn't plan, if she didn't plan and have another child, that's not on me. Holly sighed deeply. How could she possibly get through to him the severity of their situation? Christopher, the mortals are at war, one of the worst wars of the century, maybe even the millennia. Hundreds of thousands of people have died, and the number is only going to get worse. Now look, I won't sit here and pretend like your mother handled this war as well as she could have, and I won't pretend Lilith did either. But I do believe they tried, and damn it, you have to try too. This thing is bigger than you, it's bigger than all of us. And there are innocent lives at stake here. I realize this is a lot to ask a 16-year-old, but you're all we've got. Christopher snorted and sat back down. That's not saying much. 
Polly laughed a little in spite of herself. Catherine wasn't much older than you when she became queen. She was 18 when she had you and 22 when she was forced to take over the crown. That's a six year difference. The point is she didn't want to do it either. Catherine had no desire to be queen any more than you want to be king. But she realized, as you must realize, that sometimes there are things far more important than what we want. Maybe so, but she neglected her child for that so-called greater good. And you and everyone else saw her as this saint who could do no wrong. But you didn't know her like I knew her. Holly felt herself become agitated. I get it. She wasn't perfect. No one is. But damn it, maybe you're not perfect either. Christopher glared. Perfect? I would have accepted human, and to be honest, I don't even think she could be considered that much. You can't say that, Holly replied softly. Whatever pain Christopher might have been feeling, it was completely unfair to put that on his mother. You don't have you didn't have to live with her, Christopher was adamant. Holly sighed deeply, shaking her head. This was quickly spinning out of control. Look, I'm not going to get into this with you. Clearly your issues with your mother are much deeper than I could ever hope to help you help you with. But for one minute, just try and ignore the blinding hatred you have for her and think about what's good for the rest of humanity. And if you can't do that, at least think about what's good for Eric. Christopher glowered at Holly now. You leave him out of this. He stood up fast and grabbed his coat. I'll consider what you've said, but I'm not accepting anything until I've had a chance to figure everything else out. Is that clear? Holly scoffed. What other choice did she have? She nodded wordlessly as Christopher left the cafe in a huff. This had definitely not gone as she'd hoped. Yeah, that's the first chapter of a book no one will ever see again. I mean, the characters you'll see, uh, I am rewriting the story. It is a fantasy novel. It's meant to be, you know, obviously Secrets of Witches was the title. I would say that the writing is not terrible. Like, I, I do, reading it back, I was like, wow, this actually wasn't that bad. Why did I, like, hate it and kind of, like, want to start over so many times and I felt that before reading my writing but it's I definitely don't like it as much as I like this new story um so I'm going to read just the first section I have available right now of that and kind of give you an idea of just how things have changed and it's kind of hard because I feel like writing it's not something you can see visually the way you can with you know, artwork. Like if someone's artwork has gotten better over the years, you can definitely tell in a way you can't necessarily with a regular, with just a story. However, okay. So this is part one of Secret Life of Damien Carmichael, now available on, you can't even see that, now available on Wattpad. Um, and this is The New Boy, chapter one, Part one. It was a quarter past eight and Damien was sitting in the back of his first period calculus class, bored out of his skull and half delirious from lack of sleep. He'd been up deep into the night putting the finishing touches on the last chapter of one of his fanfics, and by the time he'd finished editing and getting it posted to Tumblr, an archive of our own, it was nearly three in the morning. He groaned. How was he expected to get through a block class with Mrs. Kraft, arguably the foulest and somehow still the most boring teacher in all of Westlake Prep? seemed an impossible feat to be simultaneously a nasty, mean-spirited teacher and a boring one. But in all the time Damien had been in Westlake, she had always been the worst. Even when she hadn't been his teacher, she had been awful, always yelling at students in the halls or otherwise getting them in trouble any chance she could. Damien scrolled through his Tumblr dashboard on his phone in search of something, anything that might help him stay awake but it seemed that most of his fellow fandom members were just getting to bed themselves. He would have to stay awake on his own then and try and pretend as though he gave a shit about whatever nonsensical mathematical problem Mrs. Kraft was posing this year. It was, after all, only the first day of the new year, yet in true Kraft fashion, she was already assigning them actual work, rather than going over the syllabus as the rest of the teachers no doubt would. She'd probably give them a quiz, too. Damien tried to remind himself that after... This, that after this year, he would no longer have to deal with Mrs. Kraft or anyone else at Westlake for that matter. After graduation, he would finally be able to go anywhere he wanted, so long as where he wanted was Oxford to follow in his father's footsteps. Damien tried not to think too hard on that. His life had been meticulously planned out since birth. 
Even his conception had been perfectly timed so that Damien would be born in the fall, just after the summer galas, but before the winter season. His education had been meticulously planned, as had his future. There was no room for deviation. Damien had known this since childhood. It was expected he would carry on the family name and legacy. He would get married to a respectable girl of respectable upbringing, and they would give birth to Damien Alexander Carmichael IV. Anything else simply wasn't an option. He knew his place and didn't bother to argue that fact. It was easier not to. Damien sighed, pushing his long blonde hair out of his eyes. He had been growing it out since last year, one of the few things he had control over anymore, especially since he was no longer playing lacrosse. His father had said his long hair made him look like his mother, and he wasn't wrong. The two shared similar features, their pale complexions, white blonde hair, and a well-defined jawline. But the only things he had gotten from his father beyond his name were his nose and his blue-green eyes with flecks of gold. He had spent the better part of the last 20 minutes tapping his pencil indignantly against his notebook, trying to will a new story into existence, but his mind was decidedly blank. A first for him. He didn't like this feeling. He had always been able to jump from one story to the next without much thought. Halfway through most ideas he was already working on, he'd have some sort of note for the next project, if not fully writing several scenes or pieces of dialogue for any given story. So he couldn't help but wonder why he was suddenly at a loss for how to bloody write. He'd been writing in the Wisher fandom for two years, and he'd been reading the trilogy since he was small. He knew the stories and characters by heart, or at least his own incarnation of them. So why did everything suddenly feel so difficult? The door to Mrs. Craft's classroom burst open in the middle of her droning lecture. All eyes turned to the newcomer, who looked somewhat sheepish with everyone staring at him. Damien swallowed, examining the boy currently standing awkwardly in the doorframe. He had the sudden and very strange thought that he would later recount onto his tumbler that very same day. Have you ever seen someone so unbelievably attractive and thought, wow, I'm gay? He had thick auburn hair, piercing dark brown eyes, and soft brown skin. He was wearing not the uniform like the rest of the students, but instead a pair of torn jeans and a garish red flannel shirt layered with a leather jacket, and he was sporting the crisp beginnings of what looked to be a beard. Damien wasn't certain he was meant to be a stu oh, excuse me. Damien wasn't even certain he was meant to be a student until Mrs. Kraft looked over at him and said, clearly exasperated, Mrs. Martin <laughs> Mr. Martin, I presume. In that shrill, nasal tone of hers that never failed to leave Damien with a migraine, the boy nodded. Mrs. Kraft pointed him to the single empty desk left in the classroom, right at the front. The boy crumpled into it, looking as exhausted as Damien felt, and dragging with him a backpack that looked as though it might contain his entire life. Is it just me, or does he look familiar? A girl asked from beside him. Damien turned towards the girl, eyebrow raised. Carrie Benson. He wouldn't say he knew Carrie particularly well. They weren't even really friends. They shared a number of classes together, and technically she was his former best friend's sister. She'd always been friendly enough to him, and he felt sort of bad keeping her at a distance simply because of her brother. Does he? he asked. You can't tell me he doesn't look exactly like Adam Spellock, she said. Who? Damien asked, giving her a bored look. Carrie's eyes lowered, and she shook her head, turning the... <sighs> turning exasperatedly back to her own desk and her own notes. Damien worried his lower lip. He knew exactly who she was talking about. How could he not? Adam was the main character of the Wisher trilogy, one of the biggest and most well-known book series of all time. Everyone knew Adam Spellock. Only, their classmate didn't look anything like Adam, at least not how he was described in the books. A shy, skinny brunette with no discernibly interesting features aside from his dark, almost black eyes and poor fashion choices. No, he looked more like a bronzed, muscled Adonis, the likes of which could only be truly found in fan fiction, often Damien's fan fiction. Damien didn't pay much attention in class after that. He couldn't stop staring at the new boy. Carrie was right. He did look like Adam Spellock, and once Damien had seen it, it was suddenly all he could think about. Jotting down notes in his notebook, Damien began to formulate a new story as he waited for class to be over. The bell rang faster than he would have liked, and Damien found himself rushing out of the classroom towards the staircase. The math department was located on the fourth floor of the main building of Westlake, affectionately known as the castle, while the lockers were all the way down on the first floor near the dining hall. 
he wasn't usually this careless. As a general rule, Damien made it a point of grabbing the first half of the books he needed on any given day before the day had even started. Once more, his lack of sleep had betrayed him. Why don't you talk to me? Carrie demanded, appearing at his locker only seconds after he had, slamming his locker door shut for him and barely missing his fingers in the process. It had taken everything in him not to scream. What? Damien asked, shaking his hand for good measure as he turned to face her. She was a pretty girl, he supposed, if you were into girls. She was tall with deep brown skin and tight curly brown hair. She had brilliant brown eyes and a nose piercing that could often and could often be found wearing either bright fuchsia or pitch black lipstick, depending on her mood. Currently, it was fuchsia, though with the camo button-down she was wearing over her uniform top and black combat boots, she managed to look as punk as ever. I always try to talk to you, and you just ignore me, and I just wanted to know what I did to offend you, she said. Nothing, Damien replied. He didn't know what to say, but something told him it would not go in his favor. Carrie gave him a look. A look which said, I don't believe you for a second, Damien Carmichael, and folded her arms across her chest, looking at him expectantly. Damien sighed. He supposed he would have to tell her the truth. Look, it's nothing personable. <laughs> it's nothing personal, but given your brothers and my history, Tyler's a jackass, Carrie said, cutting him off. Damien couldn't argue with her there. He may be my brother, but we're not exactly close. Carrie punctuated the word brother with air quotes. Technically, Tyler was adopted. Mr. and Mrs. Benson had been trying to conceive a second child for years, but between both of their busy schedules and a multitude of other factors, after Carrie, the couple had been unsuccessful, and so they had simply adopted Tyler at the age of two. Damien dropped his government book into his backpack and turned towards the large spiral staircase that led up to the classrooms. Westlake was made up of two main buildings, the castle, a 14-story brownstone, and the library, a four-story brick building that had been added on several decades after the main building had been built. A bridge had been added between them on the topmost floor of the library shortly thereafter. Then there was the compound, which consisted, consisted of the quad, the surrounding Westlake Forest, and Westlake Lake, and on the other side of the compound, the gym and locker rooms. Damien looked up at the staircase with a sigh. The history department was all the way on the ninth floor. Carrie turned, ready to follow him to his next class. He paused at the bottom of the stairs and turned towards her. Turn, turned to her then. Are you sure you're not that close, he asked, still not quite convinced. Positive, she said with a smile. Trust me, I hate his guts almost as much as our parents do. Damien frowned a little at that. Perhaps it was because they had once been friends, or perhaps it was just the thought of someone's parents hating them, but Damien couldn't help but be disappointed in the sentiment. Not because he's gay or anything, she added. He's just such an asshole. Damien held back a chuckle, but only just. She was right, of course. Look, he and I have very little in common beyond our last name and the fact that we're both technically a part of the LGBT community. Although, honestly, I say we take away his gay card for being such a dickbag. Damien chuckled then, barely noticing as a blur came barreling towards them, nearly knocking them over in their haste to get down the stairs. Damien wobbled, grateful he had only made it up three steps when he turned to see the mysterious newcomer running towards their locker. It was the new boy. Adam strikes again, Carrie said with a smirk. Damien turned toward her in an effort to pull his eyes away from the boy as he struggled to open his locker. I doubt that's actually his name, he said. You really don't know what I'm talking about, do you? she asked. Damien merely shrugged. He had plenty of practice playing both straight and dumb over the last two years. He had gotten mostly good at it. Carrie sighed, shaking her head, and made her way up the stairs toward her second period class. Damien hesitated on the first step, giving one last glance to the boy as he managed to finally get his locker open before running up the stairs himself. A warning bell rang out just as he reached the sixth floor. Damien groaned. He was going to be late. So that is part one of the first chapter. I'm going to be posting new scenes slash chapters every Tuesday and Friday. Um, I decided on that because I wanted it to be far enough a way that it was interesting but not so far that like between Friday and the next week that it was like so long that it was like annoying. I figured Tuesday was a good time and obviously I wanted to start on Friday the 13th because that's my favorite day. I feel like that's a very lucky day. So yeah, um, that's that. That is my 10 year kind of glow up in creating. Um, it's interesting because it's kind of, like I said, writing is very hard to say, like, 
is this improved? Is this better? It, and it's a totally different story too. So I feel like that really changes how much um, you could possibly do. Like if you were going to showcase one getting better, I guess maybe if I really wanted to do this properly, I could take this, even though I'm not using this version of the story, I could have like read this and then written like a 2019 updated version of the same scene, but like, better maybe that would have been more appropriate for this and would have made more sense but um yeah that's kind of my attempt at the 10 year challenge i cannot believe that 2019 is almost over this decade is almost over we are fast approaching 2020 that is so crazy and so amazing and um yeah that is all i have for you thank you so so much for watching and until next time Bye. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give me a like, comment down below, and keep the conversation going, and subscribe to my channel. And if you would like to see further videos like this, and just support me in general, please feel free to give to my Ko-Fi slash Patreon. All the links will be in the description box below. Bye!